space, a final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. Its five-year mission, to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. chess friends I warmly welcome you to this chess video and I thought I sh could share a game with you that I played on chess.com with one of my friends Miss Sharon Carter now her and I have some very fun games and she's just great company and I think we actually spend more time giggling and laughing and texting than we actually do with uh, thinking about our chess moves but as I've said, it results in some very fun games. And I'd like to share this one with you if I may. Begins with knight to f3, d5, d4, c6, c4, e6, knight to c3, and here Sharon plays bishop to b4. I like this move queen to c2. She played knight to f6. And here I challenge the bishop. Asking it what it is doing in my side of the chessboard. Sharon actually took on c3. Bishop takes on c3. And the computer doesn't think this is a particularly bad move. But of course the computer has no positional understanding. And it appears to me that this bishop would be much better going back to a square like e7 because it can inflict no structural damage on white and therefore there is no compensation for black for giving up the bishop pair like this this is my this is my thoughts i mean the computer thinks it's a per perfectly good move but as i've said the computer has no positional understanding but we have bishop takes c3 Queen takes c3, h6, and bishop f4. The bishop comes in immediately to take advantage of these dark squares. We have knight to e4. Personally, I think that knight b to d7 would be better. And after we give white a move, e3, castles, bishop to d3, taking away from the centre with d takes c like this. Bishop takes and then b5, playing in the style of the Moran. Bishop is forced back and then bishop to b7. And you can, sh sh sorry, you can see that she has solved the problem of her light square bishop. It now has this potentially beautiful diagonal to utilise. She can bring the rook to c8 and she can prepare the move c5. And she is solving her problems. The problem with knight e5, of course, sorry, knight e4. is that she cannot take away from the centre like this because the knight of course would be en pri. but anyhow the knight comes to e4 with tempo and I need to move the queen so I play queen to c2 Sharon castled e3 knight b to d7 bishop to d3 and here she plays an interesting move she plays f5 Yes, it cements the knight here on e4. However, it leaves 
the e5 square irrevocably weak. And because there is a dark square bishop on the board, as soon as this bishop enters either e5 or d6, it will in fact be unopposed and become a very powerful piece. Knight to e5 and g5. And this concept of a kingside attack, it makes some logical sense. The problem for Sharon is, is that she's undeveloped. She still has four pieces on the back rank and she needs these pieces to support the advance of her pawns. Knight takes on d7. There's no time to take the bishop because the rook's attacked. Bishop takes and the bishop comes into e5. Absolutely unopposed. Knight goes back to f6. Castles. Queen to e8. Bishop to e2 taking the h5 square away from the queen. And g4. And this again is an interesting move, g4. The problem with g4 is that these pawns, they can be undermined easily. And white did that, of course, with move f3. g takes f3 and rook takes on f3. And then the knight came back to e4. Now here white has a stunning tactic. I personally, I never saw it in the game. I was too busy talking nonsense. I wonder if you can see it my chess friends. I'll give you a moment just to think about it. If you need to pause the video please do so. Well, the move actually is queen takes e4 exclaim. Now, I never actually saw this in the game. Queen takes on e4. What I in fact played was rook to h3 because, well, I was concerned with this weak pawn. But let's just take a look at this amazing tactic. Queen takes on e3. Sorry, e4. Takes, f takes, and the rook comes to g3 with check. Now, the king has only a single square. He cannot go to f7 because of rook to g7 checkmate. So the only square he has at his disposal is h7. And you have in chess what is known as a windmill. Check this out. The rook will come to the seventh file and it will absolutely hoover up everything on the seventh rank, utilizing the discovered check once the king moves. Check this out. King is forced to h8. Rook takes with check, king is forced to move, rook comes back, king is forced to move, rook takes the b-pawn, king is forced to move, check again, king is forced to move. And you can see the rook is hoovering up everything on the 7th rank. And this is what we call in chess a windmill. Of course after the king moves the queen will be gone. And white will have a decisive material advantage. Now, as I said, I never saw this in the actual game. And instead, well... I played... Not knight takes on e4, but rook to h3, attacking this weak pawn. Which seemed a good idea to me at the time. King h7 and bishop f4. And here Sharon was complaining about this dark square bishop. It was so annoying for her. And, well, it's unopposed and it's, it's difficult. She played rook to h8 and, of course, I took. King is forced to move. And here, my friends, I, I blundered very, very badly. And I'd just like to take a moment to talk about 
mistakes in chess. Sometimes we can beat ourselves up over our mistakes. We think, oh, that was such a terrible move. Why didn't I see that? Now here I leave this rook en prix by playing the ludicrous move, bishop to e5. Leaving this rook absolutely free and en prix and basically blowing the game. Fortunately for me, why I don't know, Miss Carter never saw this. And in fact she played king to g8, blundering in return. Whether she thought it was a trap, whether she didn't like, she thought it was going to expose her king, I don't know, but she played king to g8. Yeah, where was I? I was talking about mistakes in chess, yeah. The fact of the matter is, chess friends, we are human beings and we are prone to aberration. We are imperfect and it, we cannot help but make mistakes. It's inevitable and therefore it's unreasonable and illogical to beat yourself up over mistakes too much. Because it's an inevitability. We will make mistakes. Okay, they might not be as bad as my mistake of leaving a rook free, but you will make mistakes. Of course, the chess player, we want to minimise them, but don't get yourself beat up over them. Just let try and learn from them. Okay, where was I before I, I got into my rant about mistakes? Excuse me. Oh, yeah. Rook takes on h8. King goes to f7. Bishop comes in. The dusky maiden is lost. Rook takes, rook takes. Bishop takes. And here I simply try to open up the king. Making, of course, use of the pin against the king. King moves. I take. Sharon takes. And the queen comes to h5. Here she played a5. And I have a checkmate in one move. But I never saw it. And instead, I greedily played queen takes on f5. Let's just take it back for a moment. Can you see the checkmate, my friends? You probably can. Queen to e8 checkmate. I did eventually checkmate like this, but it was a couple of moves later. Instead, I played queen takes on f5. King is forced to move. Queen to f8 check. King is forced to move. And eventually, I managed to find queen to e8 checkmate. It's a very, very enjoyable and fun game I played with Sharon. She's great company and great fun. Okay, the, perhaps the standard of chess is not very high. Normally people don't leave rooks free. But hey, we're, we're amateur players. But anyway, my friends, I hope you enjoyed the chess game. I'd just like to dedicate it to the memory of Leonard Nimoy who, as you are probably aware, played the character Spock in Star Trek, the original series. I, I'm not a big Star Trek fan. I mean, I don't dress up and go out as as Data or a Spock or, or something. But I did watch the series when I was a child and I have some affection for the Star Trek programmes because to me... Anyhow, they embody um, some philosophical and some moral ideas. In fact, they have intellectual content. That's what I'm trying to say. And sometimes they leave the, the viewer with some questions that they need to try and answer for themselves. So in that sense, it was a very, very brilliant and refreshing series. But anyway, I'm just dedicating it to the, the memory of Leonard, Leonard Nimoy who played Spock in Star Trek and gave so many people so much enjoyment. So suffice to say, my chess friends, thank you very much for taking the time and I sincerely wish you well with your own chess. Take care 
and goodbye. Light up your guns, bring your friends. It's fun to lose and to pretend she's overboard. Self assured, oh I know her dirty word. Hello, hello.